Welcome into 11 Personnel, presented by Monticello Bank. I'm Nick Roush, joined as always by our Adam Luckett, who has been breaking down the Eastern Kentucky Colonels since August. Uh, actually, I think that was July when your first uh, EK. Hell, since April. What are you talking about? I've been doing this. It's, it's like no hobby, Nick Roush. I've been watching Parker McKinney tape for a good minute now. We're going to talk plenty about Parker McKinney, the talented EKU quarterback. We're also going to clean up some stuff from week one, and we're going to talk to an EKU assistant. How many times are you getting FCS assistant coaches on to preview the game? That's 11 personnel. Now, it does help that that former assistant is a a, a close acquaintance who I realized like it when we were talking with C.J. Conrad earlier today uh, the interview is going to play towards the end of the show. Um, yeah, his first year on campus was my first year f- being full time with KSR. Um, so yeah, I feel like I've known the guy a while. <laughs> it's goes way back, and uh, and now he's he's coming back on the show as a coach. It's a it's a kind of a full circle moment there. Yeah, it's been we kind of addressed this with CJ. It's been really cool to just follow his career. From recruit to player to draft prospect to graduate assistant to quality control assistant to full time now tight ends coach at Eastern Kentucky. So we've seen all we've seen him like that whole thing has played out in front of us because it's just been in our sphere here at, uh, covering the Kentucky football team. So it's been really cool to kind of see him develop into wh- what he is, and now he's now he's a posi- full time position coach. He'll be back on the sideline Saturday at Kroger Field. He's one of three EKU staffers that was on Mark Stoops' staff at one point. Maxwell Smith, the first – I believe he took the first snap for Mark Stoops at quarterback. I know there was some injury stuff with his shoulder, and him and Jalen Whittle kind of juggled the the duties there in 2013. Um, But he's EKU's quarterback's coach. He also was a GA at one time for UK. Um, And so he's kind of – He's done a little bit more bounce around. He's been around a little bit longer um, than CJ. So, uh, but also Walt Wells spent two years uh, at Kentucky as a quality control assistant. So, a lot of deep ties. We're going to mention a lot of names too that you've heard in the past uh, from the Kentucky high school football ranks. Uh, Walt Wells has done a good job. I think I called him Dean Wells earlier. Uh, that in my brain, yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know what I was thinking there. Um, not, more coffee not is what, the, what you need. Exactly, exactly. Not the former Holy Cross Cougar, Carolina Panther, and uh, sack specialist for the Cats. Walt Wells, offensive line coach, spent most of his career at EK and D- EKU, WKU. Had a cup of coffee at Tennessee and also at UK. So a lot of close connections here. A lot of talented players from the state of Kentucky. We're going to get to it all. Um, just like you need to get to a Monticello Bank. They're proud sponsors, presenting sponsors of 11 personnel. They've got 21 different branches in 14, or no, man, I, I can't, yeah, 14 different counties across the Commonwealth. But you don't need to be nearby to have Monticello Bank. They'll hook you up at NBCBank.com, or you can bank wherever you go, wherever you're following the Wildcats, at with the Go NBC Mobile app. They've been in business for 128 years because they put people first. That's the promise at Monticello Bank. When you're looking to buy a home. I know interest rates are a little crazy right now. You're going to get the best rates if you buy local. Luckett is about ready to move. He can attest yes, to this. you got to get a, uh, your mortgage through a local lender. Try Monticello Bank out. They'll be fast, convenient. They're going to work for you. They're going to put the numbers on your side. Visit one of their convenient locations or online at NBCBank.com. Monticello Bank, where people matter. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. All right, Luckett, before we dive into and start playing the name game with some of these EKU Colonels, we got to talk a little bit more week one because we've got a lot of uh, whining um, a week after. They they go back, and instead of, you know, some coaches will eat some humble pie, Luckett, but others just go back to their pulpit and just start like, meh, 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 meh. Oh no, I ran less plays. Meh, 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 meh. 
<laughs> Call the Wambulance. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, the big talking point this week has been the new clock rules. Lane Kiffin said something today. Chip Kelly said something, I think, during his halftime interview. I, I This seems like a huge nothing burger to me, Nick. You're shaving like a possession off a game. I mean, it's like eight plays. I mean, we'll see what the data says after the end of the year, but, like, you know, like, give me a break on a lot of this stuff. I don't... I didn't even notice it, man. I, I swear, I didn't even notice that the rules changed. And I don't think a lot of people did. No. So, um, Ole Miss. And I'm going to tell, tell you a little dirty secret. Yeah, tell it. In the, sure. in the first half, they are rolling it. They're not stopping. They weren't stopping before. They are letting that roll. Like, they're, they let it roll on a lot of that stuff. Now, sometimes they it just depends on the crew, but – like there's not like you're not shaving a bunch of plays off, and you still get the under two minutes of, in the quarter. So I just, just it just makes it's, and Lane Kiffin of all people, he, he, they even he, asked he, him about it, and he at the SEC media days, and he act like it was no big deal. So like, okay, one game after you won seventy eight to nothing is the, the when you're gonna get upset about it. I mean, they ran seventy four plays. I mean, that's a lot of plays, and they won 73-7. to It was a running clock against an FCS team. The other thing, too, just because the clock's rolling doesn't mean the games are actually that much shorter because the commercials are still rolling, too. That first half, Kentucky versus Ball State, took forever. Now, some of it has to do with replay being a little bit slower. You know, uh, you had some injuries where you got to get the car down on the field right. So, like, it took some time. But – I mean, if Kentucky wanted to more run more offense plays on Saturday, they should have got more stops on third down. Like, it's not that big of a deal. I, I think it's funny. They're like, people play to go in there and see the game. Stuff. Like, come on. Give me a break. It's not it's not making that big of a difference. And you know what? If it makes if it makes more than two possessions difference at the end of the year, then I might say something, right? If it's 15, 20 plays, per, but it's not going to be. It's just not. It might be. In the most extreme cases of tempo teams like, you know, UTSA or somebody running no huddle and just, like, trying to tempo you to death. But, I mean, it's going to find its level. So, I, I thought I thought all those coaches were really whiny. Um, but, you know. Yeah, I just think it's – again, I think it's a lot of a nothing burger. TCU and Colorado didn't have an issue with it in their game. No. You know, it, it makes – I think stylistically, it makes the or from a strategy standpoint, it makes it the game more interesting. Uh, like we've talked about in the past, timeout usage is going to be it's critical. Your time. We didn't really get to see it with Louisville, but they were going to be in a situation there, Nick, in the red zone. Georgia Tech had the ball. Louisville had a two point lead. There was four minutes left. How they handled that timeout usage was going to be, be interesting disaster. to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then Georgia, nice Tech, Georgia Tech kind of shot themselves in the foot, so it didn't come to that. But there are going to be situations like that when a team has a lead that can milk or if a team in that situation – because you see it in the NFL all the time. They're able to run out the clock when there's four or five minutes left. Um, the Bengals did that to the Chiefs in the regular season. They got the ball with like five minutes left, drove down the field, Burrow hits – um, T. Higgins on a big third down. They're at, like the Chiefs, thirty-two, and the game was over. I mean, you see it at in the NFL. It run, you can run out the clock like that. That's where it's going to make the big difference. But I, I, I don't have a big issue with it. I don't see why people are super upset about it. But I think yeah. you'll get to the end of the year, and I, don't, I think you'll kind of forget about it. But, but I mean, we'll have to see how it plays out. We will have to see how it plays out over time. Um, that whining wasn't as funny as Shane Beamer whining over the hot dogs. And look, at my favorite thing is you knew that, oh, uh, our favorite sunglass-wearing podcaster couldn't return to the mic without um, correcting himself. Uh, or, you know, just he, he had to talk about it. And he opened it by saying, you know what? They weren't the reason why we lost. But they were eating hot dogs, and it did throw our kicker's timing off. It was a hilarious, <laughs> hilarious little, like, I actually wasn't wrong, but I'm sorry. Not really sorry, though. I, 
he, he's something, man. Like, he really is something. And, Nick, I, the, this is the first time I've really noticed this. I think in the public space, people are now starting to realize, like, this guy's a, a cheese ball. Like, why do we like this guy? And I would just like to say, I was in on that game early. Like, I was on the wagon. I was one of the first on the wagon. Um, so I, I, I'm taking my victory lap here. I, he's just, he's, he's just a, he's a phony, and then he's a sore, uh, you know, he's a very sore loser. Obviously, like you're saying, obviously. it's uh, there's always an excuse. And um, my wife calls him. I, I want to see if what do you think of this nickname? She calls Shane Beamer Mega Mind. She thinks he does he looks have like a. Megamind. He's got a very bit bulbous top rear of his head. It's like his, you're right, like almost like his brain is trying to bust out of his skull. Yeah, so that that's the name that's getting talked about. Uh, Megamind, whenever South Carolina's on, my wife is saying Megamind in the house. Uh, but regardless of that, I just, that, that stick gets old quick, man. And I think just yeah. now if people are starting to feel it, now that he's gotten some attention and it's year three and, you know, he his antics on the sideline are crazy too, like, just walking around all, you know, hyped up. Getting hyped with his team was no problem. But every call is just, like, the worst. And he's got all these facial, you know, his emotions on his sleeve in a lot of ways. Yeah, yes. His hair's always sideways. He's always got his hands <laughs> out. He put... Yes, I just, I don't, man. And you look at their schedule. They got Georgia week three at, in Athens. Good luck blocking that front with your offensive line issues that South Carolina has. Mississippi State week four at home. It's a huge game for both teams. And, you know, that's kind of a swing game, I think, for both programs this season. And then they go to Tennessee, and that's a huge revenge spot for Tennessee. Mm -hmm. That's a brutal September slate. You know, they're going to go through a ringer here. And I worry about, you know, Rattler, he took an absolute beating. I I love all of the, the spin after the game. And, you know, I'll give some credit to Dal Loggins, who was not trying to, to completely – he was just like, yeah, this is going to be a process. If this was an easy fix, we would have already fixed it When in regards to the offensive line. But I love the fans who were like – I mean, but Rattler got hit a lot, but look at his stats. And it's like, well, he, he's throwing the ball a lot because he has to. That's like, the only – he's it's out of survival. Like, he has to get rid of the ball or yeah. he's going to die. I think there was a lot of – they kind of knew what they were. Because if you watch that game, there was a lot of just quick game, a lot of screens, bubble screens, getting the ball out. And I think you're going to see a lot of that from them this year, especially the, – the worry I have with South Carolina is they don't have a Chris Rodriguez. They don't have a right. tailback that just can make something out of nothing. So if they can't run the ball lickety-split – what is that going to look like? And I think you could start – Rattler, you could tell at the end of the game, he started to feel the rush. He started to mm-hmm. look at it a little bit. And Trey Alexander had a great comment here in the, the, the chat. Beamer looks in the mirror and sees Deion Sanders. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think uh, there's a lot of truth to that. What's funny about the evolution of Beamer, too, he really first got attention when they lost to Georgia. And they had that Zoom press conference in his first season. He's like, did you see those guys out there? And people were like, oh, somebody who shoots it straight. And then, look, he's going to the mayonnaise bowl. And, oh, they poured some mayo on him. Like, he's pretty cool. They had a, a, the wide, a Scott plucky. Bit. Yeah, they had the plucky wide receiver play quarterback in that game. They beat North Carolina. Well, he's raised the bar some, but his antics, yeah. too. I, I think his antics. Now. He has expectations, and his antics, I think, ran away some talented players. Um, he has recruited well uh, from the high school ranks, but some misses in the portal really cost him. Uh, we're seeing that offensive line now. I do love, too, like people praising the North Carolina defense. They're figuring out by just playing aggressive. It's like I think Gene Chizik just wasn't an idiot and knew, like, what's what's if you watch if you If you watch the game, they're not doing anything crazy. Like, it's rushing four, and it's like your twist, your tackle and twist, and then your simulated pressures where you're dropping someone out and you bring in a linebacker. Like, it wasn't 
like Gene Chizik didn't have some Dick LeBeau zone blitz package he just unleashed on South Carolina. It wasn't crazy. It was just they just could not block, and it just got worse as the game went on. Um, and then they got all the injuries that are piling up. They lost a starting linebacker for the season. Mokaba's out for the year. Sounds like uh, Nick, uh, they're one of their they're their best defensive players. Their safety, Nick Imamori. He's probably going to be out another week with a hamstring. And you know how hamstrings go. Yeah, uh, yeah. So who knows when they're going to get him back. And so they things aren't looking good for South Carolina. And that's just a rest. We saw it last year at Kentucky. It's a recipe for disaster with that offensive line. And they don't have a top 15 defense in a bell cow running back to kind of grind out wins. And Rattler is going to get beat up this year. And they had Luke Doty out there playing slot receiver, Nick. Like They had a quarterback at running back. Like, what is going on? Like, what kind of oh, roster management is this? It's I, I just got to say, too, it really, it really takes a lot to – get us to hate a South Carolina coach more than Will Muschamp. But Shane Beamer, you know, hats off to you. Like, you did it, buddy. Like, congrats. Well done. Yeah, and, I, and I, I'm starting to think, like, maybe this is where Kentucky's playing them. That might be the perfect time to play them. They might be you dead. Know, last two year, the last two years they've had November surges. But if their quarterback's all beat up and their whole line is just bad all year, which, I mean, we'll see if they get any better. I mean, it's a long season, but – They've got some turnstiles at tackle. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be – they they could be in rough shape by the time November rolls around. So, I mean, it's a long season. Yeah. We'll see how it plays out. But I think a lot of people – my overall takeaway, where a lot of people enjoyed uh, North Carolina doing that to South more, Carolina. More people And I think Beamer, Beamer, is the, yeah. uh, Beamer is the number one reason why. that He's starting to, I think, get – under people's crawl. And I and people are just getting on the wagon with me. I've been there for a long time. I've also I also noticed when he was doing interviews, especially the pregame one with uh, Molly McGrath, the way he looked in the camera after it was over with, he's really playing up to the camera. And I oh, just yeah. I want He's the yeah, online th- coach. Yeah, he knows what he's doing out there. And it's such a stark contrast to Mike Elko when mm-hmm. I, I just he, he we got to play better and then just like storms off ready to get back to coaching his team. I just want to know when they got rid of Lee Fitting was his was it his doing or was it the other guys doing where they said you know what we need to improve our college football coverage this year. What do we need to be doing differently here at ESPN? And they took all of their surveys and they had their focus groups. Did they come up with, we need more sideline interviews with the coaches in game? Because I've never in a hundred thousand years, they've been doing these stupid in game interviews in college. And do it in basketball, yeah, and it's not fun. They've been doing them in the NBA for years. And the only time they've been entertaining is when we're like, oh, that pop, that salty, swirly old guy. Nobody likes them. Nobody. Except TV execs, and now they're forcing them down our throats in college football. I don't need to hear. Okay, halftime, I'm good with that. When they're going off the field towards the locker room, uh, when they're coming back, I, yeah, sure. I do not need them after the first quarter. I do not need them at the third quarter. It is such a waste. Yeah, it, it, that was odd. There was one game, they were doing it, and like a big play touchdown happened. Might have been Colorado TC. I can't remember what game I was watching. It was like, what are we doing? What are we doing here? I mean, it's um, so unnecessary. Just play the sport. Quit doing all the other foo foo stuff. Um, did you see? To go back to the time thing, did you see the redditor who did the clock for the Florida State game, the stopwatch? I did not. Uh, basically, he counted it down to uh, just under an hour of ads, and that wasn't including all the bumpers going in and out of breaks that are like right. presented by so and so Affleck or whatever. Yeah. 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 Uh, Affleck trivia. Stuff like that. Yeah. But all that being said, I did enjoy uh like I enjoyed hearing Lewis Reddick on uh a seemingly big game broadcast. Yeah. Uh, enjoyed my you know, I tell you so, Yeah. I tell you what I enjoyed. We got a quote from Eli Drinkowitz yesterday, I believe, talking to the media. Now they won't announce who the starting quarterback is, even though Brady Cook played 
every but I think every series but one against South Dakota. But so at the press conference, he's still not saying who his starter is. And of course, after the game, Brady Cook was a person he was talking about when he said he could take my my twelve year old daughter <laughs> or whatever. Right, right. Uh, well, Eli today goes. We'll make a decision within these walls, and we'll go with it. But I'll be honest, none of y'all's opinions matter at all. So, so write up what you want, say what you want. It don't matter. Nobody cares. Uh, I, I beg to differ. Um, drink what said in this locker room. Nobody cares. They don't. We're going to prove it on the field. Nobody cares. So you can write your opinion if you want to. Which uh, Nick? What's it? What's the old saying? If you have uh, two quarterbacks, you have none. If you have three quarterbacks, you have none. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is just like, dude, what? What? <laughs> what was that? I just. He's so weird. Like he's so Jekyll and Hyde. Well, I, with especially the with the media. Yeah, yeah. Just like one. One week he's trying to like preach and like go viral, and the next he's being adversarial. Uh, you mentioned Matter though, Dave Matter. He was essentially the, I, I I think the best way to put it, he was he was the Kyle Tucker of the Missouri beat, but like Courier Journal version of Kyle Tucker, where like he's doing the daily grind. Like he was Dave Matter was the biggest person, like doing the yes. daily grind covering. Missouri Athletics, and they just hired him to join Missouri Athletics as a director of comm and storytelling. I know that some might, you know, like it's kind of like Bosner, but doing a TV show a little different, like to the role that he was on. Like they they basically just hired Dave Matter to do what he was doing, except only positive stuff for Missouri. So I found that to be a, a fascinating hire. Uh, it probably matters more a little bit for us media nerds, but. Um, hell, now I almost got to find. I know Gabe Yarman, uh, he does a lot of good stuff for Tiger Paws or whatever their rival site is yeah, there. But yeah, yeah, he's but like, yeah, uh, but finding for me, you know, I like to find somebody from each school to, that covers them well. And he was, you know, one of the best in the conference. So, uh, unusual times in the media world. Now we've got people going to work for the messenger. I, I still don't know what that is. If somebody, if you have any thoughts about what the messenger, not the guy you shoot, but whatever the thing is that, um, I don't know, Goodman and Seth Davis are like going to write for this wasn't thing. It, I don't, I don't. Wasn't an email system called Messenger? Like it's AOL, Instant Messenger. No, I thought there. Was, well, maybe that's what it is. I thought there was like you know how my, there's Outlook. I thought there was a, like a different software company had a Messenger. I could be wrong though. I could be dating yeah. myself. Which happens yeah. a lot nowadays. MSN Messenger. Um, that, that can that work, too. It. You know, one way, one way you won't date yourself like it is if you download uh, the Game Time app. Um, you'll right. get the most up-to-date tickets um, for any game you want to attend. Just you name it, you can find it on the Game Time app, um, whether you're traveling across the country. I like uh, Roger Sherman is doing a college football road trip. Where yeah, he's, I saw that. He quit his job at the Ringer, and he's dr- driving like thousands of miles to go to games. He was at Duke, um, a Northwestern game. He was at a bunch of random games. And I bet he was using the Game Time app because it's the fastest, easiest way to get tickets. Uh, it only takes two taps on your phone. And I just I, – it's so user-friendly. Like I, I can't get over that fact. And – when you're in a hurry, right, like thinking about tickets, that's the last thing you want on your mind. And it'd be a huge pain in the butt to download them, do all that stuff. Just pull up the Game Time app, hit the event, scroll to find the best seats, tap twice, put in promo code KSR, you're going to get 20 bucks off your first purchase. You can visit them at GameTime.co on your desktop or just download the Game Time app. Promo code KSR, $20 off your first purchase when you download, download the fastest growing app the best place to get your tickets anywhere in the universe. It's the Game Time app. Look at and Nick uh, Scott Gregory here mm-hmm. in the chat. Matt House on the hot seat in Baton Rouge. Rough performance. Rough second half performance. Rough utilization of Harold Perkins. Oh, he got and, wildly criticized for that. And Devin Smith, linebacker out of Georgia, is down to Kentucky and LSU. I would call Kentucky the leader at this point for an announcement on September 22nd, which is just over 
two weeks away. So yeah, uh, not not rough few days there for the former Kentucky defensive coordinator. And so we're gonna have to see how that goes. So see if he goes makes it official to LSU. And then also Christopher Marshall asks, I know this is basketball, but can we get your all's opinion on the Big Z situation? Listen, if you want to hear some crazy outlandish or um, freak, uh, uh, some just crazy stuff, just go listen to Nick's radio show because I think Nick unloaded on them on that this morning. I so did. I would just yeah, go check out yeah. KRC. Yeah. I, I was screaming into a microphone at like 745 <laughs> this morning. It was – where, was your just, wife still home when that was happening? No, thankfully she was not. Because, like, and it's more so just being, like, disappointed that adults can't do their jobs. Do your freaking jobs, people. Like, why Why does radio hack Roush have to tell you to let the big giant play some damn basketball? It's so stupid. Yeah, it re- kind of reminds me of the Chris Rodriguez situation. Like, is there something we just don't know? Like, with the Rodriguez, it was a lot of... A lot of time we for a while we just had no idea what was going on, and mm-hmm. so I don't know if there's something there that we just don't know about. But in hindsight, too, the, the Chris that Rodriguez uh, thing, it was very funny that when all the details did come out, nobody cared. Like John Hale busted his ass and did open records requests and like went through all these files and like that would have been some Pulitzer stuff. The Herald leader would have got bomb threats 30 years prior, and like it got released right before game. Game kicked off. Nobody cared. Like it just yeah. The, the day and age, age of yeah, like it just it just doesn't even register on people's radar anymore. Um, oh, people got overpaid for jobs for sweetheart jobs that the football players had. Nobody cares. Uh, just like nobody cares if this kid can speak English or not. He's good at basketball. Let him go play some freaking basketball. So. Anyway, let's get into EKU and talk about. I, I, I kind of want to just run through some of the names because there's a lot of names um, that we have here. A lot of that, that you've heard. Travion Longmire, that guy. People forget he was one of the first commits in that. Was it 21 class? Is that right? 21? Sounds 22. 22, 22 I believe. Yeah. One of the first commitments ends up. Uh, I don't know how you want to put that. They parted ways, sort of deal. He ends up landing at EKU. Played in nine games last year. Uh, got a tackle. He's a DB for them. Uh, Isaac Dixon, he actually was a walk-on at UK last year. He was pretty active and was just like, hey, yeah, I kind of want to go play instead of be be here forever and, and not play. So, uh, former star for Pikeville or Belfry? Belfry. Belfry. He's uh yeah. he's just played he, he just played on kickoff return last week, so he's still not necessarily in the rotation, but he's gonna play special teams for the Colonel Saturday. It's Hensley who was Pikeville, mm-hmm. correct? And now yes, I've got correct. my I've got my Hensleys mixed up because there's a Hensley that's Bowley's running back. What's the first name of this Hensley that's a Jackson good Hensley, Wake Forest transfer. He was – I don't know if you were at the camp where he was there like at, at Kroger Field, where he was one of the better guys there, but he just was a little on the slow side where you're like, ah, I don't think Kentucky's going to need a receiver. But if like, you know, if they want to make a reach, like he's he's a good ball player. Uh, went to Wake, mm-hmm. was in the return game, caught a pass against the Louisville. Uh, I, I have not looked at the box score to see what he did last week because it was a very ugly box score for the Colonels, but I expect that he's going to – play a pretty big role for them after transferring from Wake. Yeah, yeah, he's one of their top three receivers. Like, he's a starter for them. Um, I'm pulling up his – he had one reception for eight yards on two targets last week. Um, but he's in the, he's going to be in the rotation all year, and he's going to be one of McKinney's top targets. So, he's going to play a big role on Saturday. McKinney uh, – actually, no, let's, let's list a few more names before I um, completely forget. But Jacob Dixon, he lasted – of all of the short-lived stints, who who actually do we do we know who lasted longer, Jacob Dixon or Marcellus Jones? I was hoping you were going there because that's where my <laughs> mind went when you first brought that up. <sighs> Marcellus Jones is one of my favorite uh, deep cuts of the Mark Stoops. They era. worked so hard to get him, both in high school and then get him as a transfer. But this is before portal, now. right? He would have had him and sit just, out the whole year. 
it just didn't work. He, uh, the story goes that Marcellus Jones, former Ohio State Buckeye, he got in a fight. I mean, this was like two weeks into being here. So he did last longer than Jacob Dixon, the former PRP tight end, um, who just was like, ah, this ain't going to work. It ends up joining CJ Conrad at EKU. Um, but Marcellus Jones, he gets on campus and he was good. He was great if you needed to talk to him. Like, I, you know, they'd introduce him to like influential people. This is Marcellus Jones. He was, ah, how you doing? But in practice, he was starting all kinds of stuff. I mean, every day it was a fight. And then finally, they come back to the locker room one day. Marcellus Jones is in a fight with Matt Elam. And it's just like, all right, we got to have a talk. Vince and Mark, they have this big, long, hey, coming to Jesus moment. You can't be doing this anymore. Like, they, they they do everything they can. Like, you, last strike. Like, you're done. Like, we can't deal with this anymore. And so afterwards, they kind of exhale. Like, okay, finally. I think we got to, through to them. Whew. All right, let's, let's move on. And then all of a sudden, they hear, Bye! And Marcellus Jones has Matt Elam in a headlock, and he's punching him in the face. And so that was the end of the Marcellus <laughs> Jones era at uh, Kentucky. Yeah. Short-lived. I think that was all in like a spring practice, or maybe yeah. it was fall yeah. camp. It was, it was not very. It was very short-lived, though. Maybe only two or three weeks. But uh, EKU, you mentioned Parker McKinney, very decorated quarterback, and I know that getting you hyped for an East. FCS matchup when they just lost 66-13, and I did end up pulling up the box score. Um, Cincinnati doubled them up in first downs, 667 yards to 302 yards for EKU. It was it was not a great look for the Colonels. Seven penalties on top of that, three turnovers, and they only converted three of 11 third downs. They really got dominated, but like well, they're a preseason top 25 FCS team with a quarterback who's broke a bunch of school records. Um, was a finalist for Player of the Year in the FCS last fall. I don't. I think he was preseason conference Player of the Year, but they won the conference last year. Like they they have high expectations for the level they're at, and a lot of it has to do with the quarterback who's completed over sixty percent of his career passes and broken their school record for touchdowns. Like he's a, he's a good ball player. Yeah, when you first look at EKU. What they were able to accomplish last year with the defense was really kind of a testament to how good their offense was. They gave up 35.2 points per game, which number 101 overall in FCS, number 94 in yards per play, 6.1 yards per play. They were really bad on defense, Nick. Um, and they lost a lot off last year's defense. Only five players that played 300-plus snaps are returning off this team, and they gave up 5.5 points per drive and 9.9 or 9.4 yards per play against Cincinnati, which are awful, awful, yeah, yeah. awful numbers. And so they they really didn't give the team a chance at all in that game this past week. But yeah, with McKinney, he was the A Sun Co Offensive Player of the Year and a Walter Payton Award finalist, which is their Heisman Trophy in the FCS last season. Through for nearly four. 4,000 yards. He was 44 yards shy of reaching 4,000 yards. 9.4 yards per attempt. Um, threw over 400 passes. Completed 68% of his passes. Threw 33 touchdowns and chipped in over 300 rushing yards. Like this was a dude that did it all for them last year, and they're asking him to do a lot this year. It's very much a modern spread shotgun offense. Spread RPO. Let McKinney stay back there and let him make throws. And that's really how their offense is driven. It's very similar to, I think, some air raid offenses you see throughout college football. And so they put a lot on his plate, and then you add in, they're breaking some new receivers in. Uh, they have their top guy back from last year, Jaden Smith, who's more of, I would say, kind of a slot type, um, who had 62 receptions for 750 yards last week. He had a strong game against Cincinnati, but after him, they're they're reloading. And I think that kind of played out in their passing game. They struggled a little, little bit against Cincinnati. Jackson Hensley is a guy that we just mentioned. He's part of that rotation. So I think they're figuring some stuff out on offense. Mm-hmm. And that, that and that's part. I think that's why part of the reason they struggled. But I do think it's important to note Cincinnati's got a legit defensive line. Like they've got one of the top 15 or so defensive lines in the country. So they kind of wrecked them up front. And then offensively, they just had a field day with EKU's defense. EKU's defense just has a lot of problems, Nick. A ton of problems. 
And when you break nope. this day game down, it really needs to be a big performance from Kentucky's offense. They should put up some big numbers in this game. Now, whether now when they let off the gas pedal will, will be determined, but um, early in this game, they should be rolling some stuff up on EKU. Um, if it, they go a couple possessions and they're not scoring or they're not moving the ball, that's a big, big warning sign. So that's really kind of my big takeaway going into this game is offensively, Kentucky – it sets up to be a good bounce back performance for them, and defensively, I think McKinney could be good enough to challenge what it, what was somewhat shaky pass defense last week. One thing that I anticipate with these spread offenses every time they play a Brad White defense, because you know his mo is not giving up the big play, being sound, being fundamental. So you can imagine a scenario where there's a lot of Dinkin and Duncan downfield. Uh, one player we haven't mentioned for him that could be a good weapon, Braden Sloan. Uh, yeah, Wayne, mm-hmm. Ca- Wayne County product. He he put up almost similar to Anthony White numbers last year, where it was like yes, I want to say 630 yards rushing, 580 yards receiving. Right, like I mean, yep. just pretty much. I mean, like yeah, he's an air raid tailback, and the. Kentucky's linebackers are kind of perfect and, to defend that, though. <laughs> you know, and so like, and he's a kicker, and he's a pretty good kick returner too. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's a big part of what they want to do. He did not have a great game offensively last week, which kind of was, in, which kind of was the story for EKU up there at Nipper Stadium. So yeah, I mean, he's a good player, and he's going to be a guy they dump it off to. Um, their right tackle, Josiah Ezram. He was on Dane Brugler's like the one of the top tackle prospects in the twenty twenty four draft class. Like they have some talent, yeah, on yeah. offense. Uh, and McKinney is one of the better quarterbacks in the FCS. And I wouldn't be surprised if he had a huge year. I mean, we'll see. He's okay. he's kind of older, but he might have had a chance to potentially get into draft consideration if he has a big season. Um, first week wasn't great for him, but uh, yeah, I mean they're gonna they're gonna throw the ball around the yard, but it's gonna be different than Ball State. Because Ball State, I mean, it was a lot of – it was pro-style stuff. Condensed formations, tight yeah. end heavy, cross-team routes, all that kind of stuff. Where this is going to be just more spread it out, RPO, and try to do it that way. Where Kentucky's going to be playing a little bit different. So we're going to learn, I think, some more about this secondary. Yeah. You know, yeah. How are they, how I, are they holding up? Well, yeah. and Because and... the safeties – I think the safeties, Nick, were a little disappointing last week. Even though they they flashed and made some big plays, I, like Zion Childress has the PI, you know that was a tough call. But I thought you would have thought they would have flashed more um, at yeah. the safety position. There was, there was they, one they did flash third, some of the big huge plays, but but there was there was one big third down crosser where it was just like, dude, that's that's the play that well, you're supposed to be there for, you know, like it, thirteen there, yards down the middle a, of the field, you know, like <laughs> there was a third and one at one point. I think it was during. Oh. Ball State's first scoring drive. They yeah. bring Childress on a blitz. He's a free runner. He has the back squared up, and he just whiffs on the tackle. It was, it was like Geiger. Safety who the... took, he took – oh, well, the Childress missed, but then you had the other one where they ran the little trick play sweep, and Geiger just took a horrific angle where yeah. it's like, dude, you've, you're running free. That's a five-yard tackle for loss, and they got to go for yeah. it in fourth down because they're out of field goal range now. Instead, you take a bad angle, and they get a first down. So um, the name of the game this week, like it – like, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to write the practice report tonight, but it's almost like I'm just regurgitating what's been said at every – clean it up. we got to clean, fundamental, detail. To, like, how much of that actually sticks to them or not? Or how much of it's going in one ear out the other? I do at least get the sense that they're kind of pissed off too. Like, the players have a little bit of personal accountability. Long uh, week of practice. It was my sense from Mark Stoops on Monday. And even at, from Lee and Cohen – on Tuesday when I was up there. Yeah. That I get the sense that they're pretty unhappy about how they played last week. Because they, they should be more detail oriented. Um, and I, I do appreciate that Stoops isn't going to punish them too bad, but he's going to kill them with kindness a little bit. Um, so I, I, I I'm just, I, I'm, uh, you know, we can talk about till we're blue in the face with matchups and stuff like that. But to your point, like this Kentucky offense should be able to roll up. This Kentucky defensive line should create so much havoc that it's just it's just a problem for EKU. Yeah, that was but, to me one of my bigger positive 
takeaways was the play of the defensive line. I thought they played well. Yeah, um, considering well, the matchup. Mm-hmm. It's just it, it, yeah. do they do they get home more on like do they just finish tackles? I mean that's that's what it is for uh, a lot of stuff. So I'm um I, I'm looking for I don't know we just we just got a message about maybe some potential recruiting stuff happening so maybe we got distracted there for a minute but um as Stoops would say this is about us like how much does Kentucky make the leap from week one to week two if they do I mean this should be a 50 burger um in my mind I don't know how much Stoops will want to call off the dogs or not I'm gonna be curious what this line's gonna be saw that Louisville was minus 41 against Murray State um so I'm I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I don't want to say yes. nervous at all, but this, this should be a fun watch though, because Kentucky should dominate and whatever, um, criticisms you have of this team, like if they're, they're going to, they're going to be highly scrutinized, even in a, what should be a blowout win. I think he is going to call off the dogs. We won't see what happened last week. He won't do that to Walt Wells. No, um, if this no. if the situation arrived, but I do think they're they're gonna be this is gonna be some level of motivated team. I don't think this is going to be the necessarily like fall asleep at the wheel non conference game that we see almost every year under Stoops. I think they're gonna be pretty focused, at least just judging what what we're hearing. I think for Leary, it's a big game too. Nick, um, he didn't play well. Saturday. No, no. Like, I don't think it's something to worry about, but he didn't play well. I mean, we need to call a spade a spade. Yeah. Uh, and I think he didn't have a lot. Like, to me, I, I don't think he had a lot of help in a lot of ways. Um, so he needs some more help, but I think it's a big game for him to come out and play well. And what confidence? And on, Get some confidence. Yeah. Well, just hit on throws he should hit on. More so, yeah. like, kind of intermediate throws. The big throws are what they were. If the guy's not open, the guy's not open, but the more of the intermediate throws I think for him to hit on is going to be important. I think for offensive line, you want to come out and kind of impose your will. So running the ball, that, to me, that's where that stands out the most. I think they did some good things in the run game, I thought, last week. And I think you what you want to see is that continue and roll up a big number on the ground and then hit on some explosive pass plays because Cincinnati hit on a ton of them. Um, mm-hmm. They were just running by EKU guys. And Kentucky on paper is better at quarterback and receiver than Cincinnati is. So um, you should see something similar, I think, happen there. Now, I think Stoops, if he gets the lead, he's going to call off the dogs probably quicker than Satterfield did yeah. on Saturday. But I think th- th- this first half is really kind of important to me. Kentucky just needs to handle their business, get out to the lead, and then you can do what you want in the second half. Um, but if they come out and kind of mess around again, that's not a good sign. And I think most importantly – you need to get Leary going, get, get him in a rhythm, because you can't really have two kind of clunky games in a row. or you, That's not what you want to see. Uh, so I think one game it's fine, but if that happens a second game in a row, it's going to be like, okay, what's going on there? <sighs> we'll, we'll find out Saturday, 3 p.m. It is, uh, as Freddie Magger would call it, a computer game. This is going to be your SEC Network Plus or ESPN Plus. You can get it if you've got a subscription to either. Um Unless you're just go to game time and get, get 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 in the stadium. Go over to that, game time and get in the that's stadium. The move. That's the move. Um, here's another thing too. I know we give you twenty bucks off with our promo code KSR. It's also Heroes Day, so if you yep. are fire, EMS, police, military, any one of those first responders, uh, Kentucky's got deal for you on tickets. I've got information up on the website uh if i don't have it up now it's check the uh, the there's there's also a link um at ukathletics.com where they have barry on brown trevin wallace scored a touchdown you can also find that link there uh if the link's not live tonight it'll be live early tomorrow morning on ksr but uh, uh ron Gaines, his mom's singing the national anthem he's That's the new right. long snapper um, his mother is the voice of Chicago PD. So whenever Chicago PD has a big ceremonial anything, she's like singing the anthem or the Chicago song or whatever. So I'm, that, that'll that be exciting. Uh, we also are going to have a lot of cheerleaders and dancers and like youth sports. Like it's like youth sports day at the Krogue as well. Um, so between that, I know the folks in it's Richmond, be they'll travel weather. well to this game. Oh, yeah. Beautiful really weather. Nice. 
So you couldn't uh, ask for much better on the second Saturday or second, I guess second Saturday, yeah, in September. So it's going to be beautiful weather, midday kickoff. You get a, it's, it's you get enough t- time to tailgate, but you also can get home in a decent hour. So yeah. I know a lot of people are big fans of these midday games uh, for that reason. So it should be a fun, fun day out there at Kroger Field. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk more about the weekend slate. Like, can Coach Prime redo it? Uh, Alabama, Texas, bum, bum, bum. Is Miami A&M this week or is that next weekend? That is this week, 3.30, at the same time. We also got Eastern Michigan on the road, which is a principal play. And we'll get to all that um, pigskin preview on Friday. More importantly... The props came in the mail, Luck. It season two. I've up my ante, Uh-oh. so we we've got more props to work well, with. Well, so. your cousin is not a. He hasn't been a dog yet. So I mean, I'm waiting for the first time Louisville's a dog to get the. Uh, what am I going to put on a bird head props. or something? <laughs> bird head brows. Uh, <laughs> but we'll have more of that KSR YouTube channel on Friday. But before we go. We're going to speak with C.J. Conrad, former Kentucky tight end, now current Colonels tight ends coach. He previews the game, and we're going to we're going to end the show speaking with an all-time UK great, second most career touchdowns by a tight end in UK football history, Keystone Lagrange's finest, C.J. Conrad. Man, that's an ugly face. Just look at that. Frozen. <laughs> frozen in time. Um, I'm not it's sure still if- frozen on the – the. Uh, there it goes. Oh, we're still – we're live. Yeah, 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 we're still live. Yeah. <laughs> well, my Pete's headphones back on. It out. Uh, Tight end coach for the Eastern Kentucky Colonels, C.J. Conrad, who's a uh, new kid on the block in Richmond, was wearing Kentucky blue – not that long ago. Now you're going to be on the other sideline. CJ, do you know where the visitor's locker room is? Are you going to go wandering into the wrong place on Saturday? Oh, man. I have, I actually do. I know what end zone it is, but I have no idea what it looks like. No, like, no clue at all. So it's going to be uh, completely new for me. I'm sure it's not uh, quite as nice as the home locker room or the coach's locker room at, at Kentucky. Well, it, it, it is it – have you had time? Um, I know it's probably got to be busy um, when you're in the grind and, like, you know, watching tape and doing everything that entails being a head coach. But have you had a moment yet to just kind of, like, exhale and be like, it's kind of cool. Like, I'm, I'm coaching against the, the, at, at the same school that I was once scoring touchdowns at. I'll, I feel like I'll feel that way right before the game on Saturday. Um, it's been kind of crazy. Uh, you go, you, know, you just roll, you know, this is how this season, the grind of the coaching goes, you just roll to the next week. And this week it's Kentucky. And yes, it is. I mean, it is a little different because I have a little bit more perspective on the defense, especially more so the personnel. Um, anybody can kind of see this game when you watch it on tape, but to watch the personnel and, and kind of to know, you know, the type of players we're going to be going against and, and uh, you know, it is different. Um, it's going to be very cool. Um, I'm not shying away from that. Uh, I'm not going to act like this is just, I mean, it is another game and it is a huge game for us because it's a great opportunity against an SEC opponent. But yeah, I played here. I got a lot of memories. I got a lot of like very, very strong relationships with the players and coaches. And, um, it's definitely going to be cool. And I think it's going to be cool for our players and, and what an opportunity. Uh, I, I'm Liam said he's going to have to switch up the schedule. Like it, make sure that he doesn't go stealing the signals. All right, because you used to be the guy over there doing the little, uh, yeah, you know, uh, all the all the moves. So we can't be that familiar with the offense. Okay. If I can stress Liam out at all, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, um, you know, well, it, it'll be cool. Obviously, yes, I know that offense very well. Um, uh, but you know. I got my hands full on, you know, checking out the our, their defense too. So it's been, you know, that's, you know, part of the game. And, you know, obviously we're going to do our best to, you know, uh, our defense is going to go out and do their best to, you know, g- give Liam problems. And, and uh, you know, as much as I can help, I'm going to try to do that. CJ, when you, when, I guess when the contact, however, made between you and EKU, when did it hit you like, oh, wow, I'm going to be coaching against Kentucky in like a, mu- a couple months? 
Did you well, think about it at all before you took the job, or was it like, oh, oh crap, I'm I got to play those guys week two? Well, when you're, uh, yeah, in the summertime, like us younger coaches, we break down other teams. So I actually just got done breaking down EKU's uh, offense, you know, yeah. or, or sorry, their defense. Um, and I was just, and then all of a sudden, uh, obviously this kind of, this this happened in like mid June, and out and. As soon as they like got off the phone and knew I was gonna get the job, I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, we play. I see you boys week two. Like all those guys, you know, in the office are giving me. They're obviously very happy for me, but uh, you know, like we're a lot of joking going on and, and uh, busting chops and we'll see you at the fifty. You know, those types of things. Yeah. Which, is, which I, I'm excited. Those guys are great guys, and I still have strong relationships with. So I'm excited to see them Saturday. And one of those guys that'll probably be busting chops was your position coach in college. Now you're coaching the same position at EKU. You know, in anything, you have to make it your own. But what, maybe what's one thing you learned from Vince Merrill that you're going to try to bring to, you, you know, or that you've already brought to, yeah. to being a full-time staffer and being an assistant? I think what Vince does really well is probably, the, the, in my opinion, the most important thing in coaching, which is he's got his guys on Saturday, every day practice, wanting to run through a wall for him because of the culture that he set in that room, the standard or the physicality. I know you guys have heard him say the no soft blank. Yeah. Um, like that, that stuff's real. His players love him, but they also respect him. And they want to, they want to go out and, and give everything all. So that was like, when I got the job, I'm like, like I'm, I'm a young coach. Like, you know, you kind of, you gotta have to make sure your players respect you uh, first and foremost. And, and he, he has that respect over there. And that's why those guys, Perfect, no, but every week they strain, they go hard. And, and coaching in this industry, if your guys can do that, they may not be perfect, but they're going to come out, you know, winners in the end. And that's what I'm trying to do. Um, it's been going well so far, but we got, you know, no ways to go. Uh, I'm curious, CJ, you went from a scheme that's heavy on tight ends and big packages to uh, an offense that kind of spreads it around with a, a, a very accurate, a talented quarterback. So, how has that adjustment been? And you know, in dealing with guys, you know, like Josh Caddis, built a little bit different um, in the SEC, blocking down there on the end line. So, how has that adjustment been? Well, it's been actually really good for me to to learn. You know, I feel like I, I got a little bit of it when I when I worked with Coach Grand in twenty. Uh, it's a similar, you know, uh, spreadish uh, that Coach Graham was working with in twenty, and obviously I played in. Um, but it's really been good for me because the last really the last two and a half years, I mean, I've been pro style, 12, 13 personnel. Um, you, like you said, I mean, big tight end sets and uh, it's good. You know, I'm glad I learned that. I, that's something I'll take for me forever. Something I enjoy. This was, this has been a really, really good for me uh, to learn uh, the different types of things in terms of the RPOs um, and th- things you can uh, take advantage of in defenses. And, and um, you know, I, I like my tight ends a lot, um, a lot. They're, they're, they're great kids. They, you know, they're, they, they play super hard. I think talented. We're a little banged up right now. Um, but, um, I like my room that, you know, they we use them a decent amount, more 11 personnel than 12, but we do sprinkle in some 12. I always try to, you know, get them in there as much as I can speak my opinion <laughs> and, um, all that stuff. But, you know, we just got to just keep pushing. And I like where we're at um, in terms of, you know, tight end, but we just got to keep, you know, Keep the consistency going. One, one more thing on the transition, just going from DA analyst, whatever I, you had yeah. a bunch of fun titles, but what's the jump like to full time assistant coach? And uh, maybe some of the responsibilities that are great, but also that uh, regular Joe doesn't realize that, like, oh man, that the assistant coach is doing that too. Um, I guess really the thing that is the the number one thing is the fact that at the end of the day, whatever we put on the field on Saturday, uh, tight end wise is, is, is my, my name. You know, obviously they're the players that are doing it. It's about them, but I'm responsible for them. Like when I work for Vince near GA, like, yeah, like I got them ready throughout the week with Vince and we tried you know, at the end of the day, though, we walked in that Sunday staff meeting. It was me that was that was in trouble if they didn't play well. And that, that's a responsibility. That's a pressure that you feel. And that's the first time I felt that. Like, it's a pressure that I felt when I was a player. It's kind of nice to – not because at the end of the day, that's how you get better as a coach. Like, this is making me a better coach, this opportunity. Like, 
I feel every day thinking about rep counts and how many, hey, what guy's getting what in practice? Um, you know, did I give him the best opportunity? Did I give him that look in practice? Like, those are the types of things when you're a GA, like, you don't, I'm worried about the scout team and getting that stuff lined up. Like, I'm not, you know, I got to constantly ask how my kids are doing, like, classroom-wise, making sure they're getting their treatments, like, all these things that they, I mean, nobody really thinks about, but they're they're really important. And, and I just try to, yeah, that's been a definitely – adjustment but these are you know it's a pressure i feel but it's a good pressure i don't mean to say it like in a bad way i love it it challenges me like it how much has the defensive coaches try to get your ear this week without giving away too much <laughs> oh i know i know i know cj that they are they are bending your ear over there trying to give whatever intel they can uh no i mean I've, obviously I've, I've helped them out um and yeah and, but a lot of it's like sometimes I was telling somebody this uh, the other day, like sometimes a little bit of it is overhyped in that matter. Like right. it's on tape now, too. Um, so mm-hmm. I've more so have talked about personnel to these guys, you know, what guys are good at what, you know, what are they not so good at? Um, what are their weaknesses? Those are more so the things that like, you know, personnel, because obviously I know these guys. I saw them in practice all the time. Um and knowing Liam, like that, that stuff, like he knows that too. So, and so it's not any, anything, you know, it's actually less than what you would think. But yeah, and making, uh, yeah. yeah. And making the jump to EKU, how much has it helped that there's so much familiarity with the EKU staff with obviously Walt Wells coming from Kentucky and just Maxwell Smith, obviously mm-hmm. on the staff as well. How much has that helped you in your kind of transition to your first time being a full-time assistant? Uh, it's been really good. Obviously, Coach Bowles has been awesome. I knew him when I was a player. I never worked with him, uh, but gosh, he's he's the best. Very, very similar to Coach Stoops. Uh, just do your job and not a micromanager. Just been so good for me so far and, and been very supportive of me. Maxwell's been great. It's actually kind of funny because Maxwell was with me my first year being a GA, and now he's with me my first year being a position coach. Um, so, you know, he taught me a lot when I first you know, got going in, in 2020, uh, learning the ins and outs of the X and O's part, which I had no idea about. Thought I knew it all when I was coming off being a player, but I didn't. Um, so and being, having Maxwell around, especially he was here in the spring, so it helped me in June. To, I mean, I had to learn this offense quick now. I mean, it was a quick turnaround. It was not a normal hire, not a normal time to get hired. So it's been a, kind of a whirlwind, but he's definitely helped me, you know, get on my feet and, and hit it running. So you were around for seven seasons. It's a long time in, in one spot. Uh, so I'm sure it got pretty uh, routine to just, yeah. all right, well, we got camp over at Kroger, you know, let's, let's run over. But is there, um, when you think back to when you were actually suiting up wearing the uniform, is there a play in particular from Kroger Field that, that stands out more than the rest? Mm, Kroger Field. One play. I don't know. I feel like in twenty it, the in the twenty eighteen game against Mississippi State was probably one of the cooler things I've been a part of. Um, they were really good, really good on defense, and just to feel like like I felt like we just took over that game. There's two in terms of the run game, like the physicality. I mean, wearing out guys like I mean Montez Sweat and uh, who is that uh, Simmons. Simmons Simmons and Simmons. like um, uh, Jonathan Abrams. Like it was like wow. We're weird. Like that was cool. The the roar in the place. And then the last thing I remember about that game was the last drive. That's where I remember looking at Josh Allen and be like, this guy is different. Like they couldn't block him. Like he got two two sacks in the last drive, like a strip sack, and like the place was just erupting. Like it um so that was really, really cool story. So that was probably my favorite um memory at, at Kroger, definitely. Mm-hmm. Right. I think um, uh, you know, maybe that trip to the Como um, a week or two later might might pop a little bit more. Yeah, that uh, was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe Moorhead coming back to Kroger Field next week too, like it. So uh, That's right. I'm sure it'll be a little bit uh, a little bit different then. Uh, but yeah. CJ, we are we are. I know the Big Blue Nation is really cheering you on. You're one of their favorites, but I don't know if it would be an interview with you if I didn't ask you this question. Is this the year Kentucky finally throws it to the tight end? Oh man. <laughs> 
you know Vince at the beginning of the season is always going to tell you that you know they're going to catch a million balls. Which like clockwork, man. I, oh yeah, yeah. No, he's uh, they're talented, man. I that was the one thing when I was leaving, uh, and I knew I was leaving in June. I remember telling Vince, like, dude, of course I'm leaving when. I really do believe what he is saying. He's not blowing smoke. This is the most talented room he's ever had. I mean, I was fired up to coach those guys, but obviously could not turn down an opportunity like this and, and um, excited to be here. But um, they're talented, and they should you – know, the game last week was weird. I uh, Even watching it just on film and, and talking to those guys, like, offensively, I think, you know, they, they, they kind of didn't get in the flow of things. And for tight end play, that's important because at the end of the day, a lot of things that – tight ends get the ball for is off the play action pass and it just wasn't a ton of opportunity for that pretty crazy that brendan bates was hosted cj on his official visit and he's still playing <laughs> you know it's wow yeah no i hosted brendan bates <laughs> oh no he might be 30 we, nobody knows how old bates is yeah no nobody knows yeah it'll be good to see him i mean i like that is played, crazy. With, played, with, you... played with him coach <laughs> coached him and now coaching coach against him Oh that's, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Do you, Lucky, yeah. do you got any final thing for uh, CJ before we let him go? No, just uh, thank you, CJ. It's been really cool just kind of watching your, your growth. I mean, just I, we a lot of people as a player, I remember you as a recruit, making me feel old. I remember following you as a recruit, and now you're now you're a assistant coach over there on EKE. So congrats on all your success, man, and best of luck moving forward. I appreciate you guys, yeah. Excited for Saturday. It'll be fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, CJ Conrad. You know him. You love him. Congrats on the on the big moves in life. You get you get married. You get a new job. Like everything's yeah. coming up, CJ Conrad. So uh, best luck this fall, except for Saturday. Appreciate that. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. Thank you.